watching Over the Edge from Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. And we're back with Brian Keating. Now, Brian, there was another experiment after Bicep, Bicep 2. How did that differ from the original one? Differed, you know, more or less in the same way that an iPhone 10 differed from the previous iPhone, uh, which I guess was confusingly the 8. <clears throat> but anyway, the, the technology had matured so much in our field, the ultra-sensitive detectors that can see these wispy, faint photons from just after the Big Bang had matured so much that it really wasn't possible to improve them, to make them more sensitive. So just like your iPhone camera, it really comes down to improvements in the number of pixels, say, in the camera, not necessarily how sensitive or what the properties of the individual pixels are. So we went from uh, 49 pixels in Bicep 1, or what we just called Bicep at the time, to 256 pixels in Bicep 2. And they were of a different character, but they were basically just as sensitive as the original 49 pixels in Bicep 1. Uh, and so the main innovation was this increase by a factor of five. And, uh, but, but everything else was really co uh, common between the two. It used the same telescope design, which is just the simplest telescope that humanly exists, which is a pair of lenses separated by uh, a certain distance appropriate to focus microwave light, in this case, onto not your retinas, as you do with an ordinary optical telescope with glass lenses. These used, you know, polymer lenses and focused microwaves onto detectors made of what are called superconductors. And these superconductors, if you've ever had a discussion of these on your show, they're quite fascinating. They have absolutely zero uh, resistance to the flow of electricity. They dissipate no energy when they're cooled down to their what's known as their transition temperature. These are magical kind of um, uh, properties of matter that only a certain few compounds actually exhibit. Uh, it was discovered over 100 years ago, this phenomenon. Anyway, when you connect a detector like this made of a superconductor that has zero resistance when it's cooled below a certain temperature, in our case, we cooled the detectors to about 0.25 Kelvin. So this is minus 454 degrees Fahrenheit, just about a whisker above absolute zero, literally a quarter of a degree Kelvin above zero, absolute zero. If you cool a detector like this to that temperature, it will superconduct. But then if you put some source of heat onto it, even minute wispy trails and faint photons from the Big Bang's aftermath, the CMB photons, it will transition out of being a superconductor. So it'll go from superconducting zero resistance to finite resistance. And that makes it almost a perfect thermometer. You can use it to detect the most minute changes in power. In fact, these detectors are so sensitive that in just one second of measurement, it can detect a billionth of a billionth of a watt of power. So you could have one watt light bulb and you could divide it, you know, you could get it so that it's only producing one billionth of a billion, 10 to the minus 18 watts, and it will detect it in one second. And so when you gang together, in this case, we gang together 512 of them, one, uh, one in each polarization state, and that makes uh, 256 pixels. They became the most sensitive camera ever made for detecting the twirling, swirling pattern of microwaves called BMODs. Now, you detected something with these instruments, right? Yeah. So what these instruments were designed to go after is exactly what we detected. And of course, there's always this risk when you're a scientist or even, you know, a, a layperson that you might go looking for something and you have a predisposition towards seeing it. And that's a phenomenon known as confirmation bias. And we on the team were very much aware of this, that we would guard against the inevitable potential to see what we want to see and confirm our preconceived prejudices. And so in our case, we did a lot of tests and the main uh, kind of contaminant that we were worried about polluting our signal was not a cosmic signal, but it was an astronomical signal. It was a signal from dust in the Milky Way galaxy. And we fretted about it for mostly, most of a year before we released the results on St. Patrick's Day 2014. And that we could finally dismiss the concerns really came down to a judgment call. And we made a judgment call that, that we had seen this swirling, twisting pattern of microwaves called B modes, and that we hadn't seen the evidence for uh, dusty pollution that would produce and mimic the signal in exactly the same way that we would be led to believe was real. And in the end, we, uh, we knew that we didn't have enough data at, a, at enough different what are called microwave frequencies to resolve the combined effect of dust plus the cosmic signals. So we knew we could potentially be measuring both. And then to get rid of the dust signal that we didn't care as much about, 
we went to our collaborator slash competitor, a billion euro satellite called Planck. And the Planck satellite had been orbiting for the same amount of years as we had been observing from the South Pole from, and except they had detectors at more than one frequency and they could potentially see the dust. And so we went to them and said, please give us your data. And they said no, and they refused to share it with us. And I, for one, thought, well, the reason they're refusing to share it with us is because they saw the signal that we're trying to see and they don't want to help us out because they want to scoop us and win their own Nobel Prize. And it wasn't until really only about six months ago you know, so this is almost five years after the discovery and announcement that later we uh, had to recant. This was shown that they never had even close to the sensitivity that we had. So it was kind of like a, a battle, you know, with a, with a phantom enemy that they really didn't have the data. And we kind of, at least I did, uh, confused ourselves into believing that they did. And that may have had an impact, at least on my thoughts, about why we needed to publish lest we perish, you know, so to speak in the hunt for the Nobel Prize. And again, in my, in my opinion, not, this is not necessarily reflective of everyone on the team. What's the Nobel Prize? I mean, it's hard to find a bigger accolade in even beyond science. Yeah, it's, 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 that's right. That's the one thing. But it has a lot of problems because you can only give so many out and there's a process. Yep. So in exactly. striving for the Nobel Prize, you essentially release the data too early without being able to... Um, It'll completely eliminate the possibility that it might have been dust. What is it about the Nobel Prize that is so alluring to you? What what drove you for it? Well, for me, it was, uh, and, and again, I'm only speaking for myself, but for me, it was a desire really to prove myself, not only to myself, but also to my father, who had been a great scientist earlier in his career. And it was rather stingy, uh, you know, with his with his credit towards me in some sense. And so I had uh, constantly as a kid tried to strive and get his attention. And I knew there was one thing he didn't win uh, as a mathematician and a, you know, kind of theoretical physicist. He never won the Nobel Prize. And I knew I could you know, unequivocally <laughs> be ranked in some sense in this way that sometimes fathers and sons compete with one another. And so it's a very base thing to say, and I'll, you know, it's, it's a little humiliating to admit it. But that was part of my motivation as a young scientist to make something, make an impact on the world that was undeniable. And there is no higher accolade. There's just simply no greater presti prestige in the world than winning a Nobel Prize in the field of physics, especially. And this is shown time and again. You know, I was just at NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Boulder, Colorado yesterday, meeting with some colleagues who are doing phenomenal work there. And they took me to this building and they said, this building was built because of the Nobel Prize. <laughs> and I, I just couldn't, I mean, I knew it was true because the guys who had done the great work needed a better laboratory to improve upon their work. And this is discovery and, and laser ion trapping and things like that. They had made a phenomenal discovery. They said, oh, well, we need to go further. And, and you like what we've done so far. We've won a Nobel Prize. And so they basically were able to get this, you know, many, probably hundred million dollar building built. Uh, and, you know, it's deservedly so. But there's simply just really revealed to me that there's no greater power in science. It literally determines the roofs over scientists' heads. It determines how much you get paid. It determines if you're going to get tenure or not. Uh, it determines, you know, all sorts of incredibly important things. Now, admittedly, it's it's just scientists who really suffer from this. But I think there's something pernicious about the members of society who are supposed to be the most rational that then end up basically worshiping this idol, which is really chosen by, you know, about 400 white guys in Sweden with some outside influence as I, I got to participate in. And and so in both losing the Nobel Prize is sort of a, a play on words. It, it literally means how I lost it, but it also means that there's parts of the Nobel Prize that needs to be lost and got rid of in order for science to progress. And through my encounters with almost winning it and then being one of the nominators for the Nobel Prize the year I could have potentially won it, I came to see the great kind of distortions. And in the book, I described, you know, in three chapters, I describe kind of ways that the Nobel Prize has distorted reality, kind of refracted reality for scientists and how, you know, I've come to feel a feeling of liberation. I mean, one of my friends who's a LGBTQ uh, individual, he was saying like, you know, after reading my book, he was like, that felt like when I came out of the closet, <laughs> you know? And, and I'm not comparing the two, but, but nevertheless, it was a sense of liberation. Like I'm no longer beholden to this relic, artifact, icon, idol. And now I can do science for the purity of the quest. And um, yeah, a little ashamed that it took me so long to realize it. And you know, a lot of people say, oh, you just have sour grapes, you didn't win it. 
And I say, believe me, if you want to test if I'm sincere or not, you know, just get them to offer me the Nobel Prize. And if I reject it, you know, you know, I'm not a hypocrite. You know, and but the it has to be said that there are a lot of people that never give up that quest. You know, that, yes, that chase, chase it their entire career. And yeah, you're absolutely right. They, 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 I saw a front page, you know, ad in the New York Times once, or this guy was arguing uh, he should have won the Nobel Prize not once, but like twice or so. It just, it's, you know, and someone had to take out, out the money for that ad. It just seemed so pathetic to me. I mean, in a hundred years, I'd be very surprised if the Nobel Prize is as prestigious as it is. Uh, I also heard somebody recently saying over the CRISPR, you're familiar with the CRISPR gene yes. editing kind of patent battle that's going on. That one person said that they would give up their share of the patent rights, you know, which could be worth a trillion dollars, you know, for guaranteed Nobel Prize, you know, kind of a sole attribution, which I just find very sad. And it reminded me, as I say in the book, there have been studies done on on Olympic caliber athletes who would trade, you know, decades of their lives at, at age 20. They would choose to die at age 35 if it meant guaranteed no, uh, uh, <laughs> guaranteed gold medal in the Olympics. And I just think that's sad. Uh, and it's, it's an emblem of our of our error that prizes celebrity and fame and scientists i feel should be immune to that and i am as i said ashamed i wasn't but now my eyes have been open and i do feel more of a sense of liberation than ever before you could become the only person to ever melt down a nobel prize for the scrap <laughs> metal <laughs> that's what you, you could accept it and just say you won it and then melt it down <laughs> uh, <laughs> we'll see about that yeah now one thing that the Nobel Prize does, and, and awards like this, is they increase the competitive nature of science. And this has always been around. You, you go into Galileo in the book, and how Galileo didn't even show Johannes Kepler his telescope. Is that a good thing? Is it, is it as you liken it, a science to entrepreneurship? Is that a good thing? Does that help, like, in business, where it actually drives innovation? Is it a good thing in science, though? Yeah. Or should science be more deliberate? I think it should be more deliberate. It should be more open source. We tr tend to treat things, uh, you know, for example, we have data that we've never released from BICEP. Uh, and we have this attitude that the data belong to us. And and that's really a very uh, fallacious argument. Like Apple, you know, doesn't show their, uh, their patent, you know, their trademark secrets to Samsung. Uh, you know, they don't have to, right? Because the government didn't fund Apple. It's not like an extension of the U.S. government. Whereas, you know, something at NIST, like I was just saying, they have to publicize the information, the discoveries that they make. And so it's it's very different. Now, you know, NIST can win, or scientists at NIST can win Nobel Prizes, happen very often. But, uh, but it's a little bit different in the world of, you know, say cosmology, et cetera. We do tend to treat these uh, these data as if they belong to us. And that I think is fostered by a sense of fear of competition, uh, fear of missing out, fear of being wrong. And it is a form of bias, which I don't think has a, a place in publicly funded science and even in privately. So now I'm the principal investigator of a very large collaboration. It's entirely privately funded by the Simons Foundation. It's called the Simons Observatory. And they have asked us to you know, do everything in our power to make our data public. And it costs a lot of money for us to do that. It takes a lot of time. And we don't have any formal obligation to do that, but we're going to do it because it's the right thing to do. Science, the data, the universe belongs to all of us, not just you know, very cloistered few who might, might or may not want to use this to advance different aspects of, of our own careers. So. We seem to be very far from the territory that Alfred Nobel originally envisioned with his award. How do we get back to that, the original intent of the prize? Yeah, I mean, I think the original intent of the prize was was pure, and it, except it was really to give it to sort of the lone genius of not really just of science of what we could nowadays call, you know, pure or fundamental science, but it was really more for inventions. He wanted to encourage inventions and also perhaps to kind of solidify the science, you know, that wasn't fully settled at the time. We, there were no journals like we really have nowadays. I mean, there were maybe one or two. Nature was probably around back then. I think it was. Uh, but that was it. Now we've got literally thousands of different journals. And so, you know, different reports will be scrutinized and critiqued. But uh, but the question that we have is, is whether or not our, you know, our, our process of, of incentivization of science is a good thing. Uh, should science not be its own reward? And it's hard to argue with the Nobel Prize is like the only way that scientists achieve fame, say, or, you know, unless they write some huge 
book or you know become celebrities like Neil deGrasse Tyson. But other than that, most very few people know anything about science at all. So you know, I don't I don't come to crucify Alfred Nobel, but I do feel like this notion of prizes going to single individuals is really outdated. And it's not reflective of how science is done. And so in the book, I talk about ways the prize could be reformed and made more in concert, not really with what Alfred Nobel wanted. Uh, They've strayed really far away from what he wanted, but use the Nobel name to reflect how science is actually done nowadays. And it's much more collaborative. It's international. It's interdisciplinary in a way that he could never have envisioned just just as you know someday we we would find it hard to imagine you know a computer could win the nobel prize someday in physics but it could theoretically happen uh, depending on how science is actually done 50 100 years from now that was a bit of material that went over the edge a bonus clip from a full episode of event horizon new episodes every thursday so do be sure to hit subscribe The full episode should be on your screen right about now.